2K21 and we have a super special treat for our rotor your pants today turbo four rotor RX-7 this thing is an absolute work of art let's go ahead let's go ahead and check it out to say I absolutely love Logan's car but I think this might might have stolen my my sweet spot in my heart for the four rotors <laughs> oh dude Logan's car is insane it's, a, it's it's the most amazing machine but man this thing is right up there with it brother I would say like these are probably two like Logan's car in this car two of the most unique cars I think that we've ever had a chance of filming I mean I'm so so grateful you were able to come out here well, thank all you, the way man. from Alabama cool, man, man. Um, super cool to see you guys. I watch all your videos. Dude, and, hell yeah. Thank you. you. Know, just sit at home and watch YouTube and <laughs> been watching you guys forever. It's hell like, yeah, man. And now we're crazy, here. Dude. And now we're here. Yeah, yes. So cool. Yeah, let's take a look at the interior here. I mean, this the entire car, just walking around it, it's an absolute work of art, man. Thanks, man. Like, it's You can tell so much love, so much time and passion was put into this project. Thanks, man. How, how long did this build, I mean, how long have you had it? How long does this build take you? Let's see, I started on it about four years ago, and it's taken about 8,000 hours. <laughs> so, you know, I've, been, I've worked on it, like, you know, I work. A lot of elbow I, grease, a lot of well, love. Yeah, nice. <laughs> and weekends, and, but we just never give up. You Teamwork makes going, a dream work. You never quit, you never stop. Once you're invested like this, you have to finish. If you don't finish, then what was it for, right? That's right, man. That's I'm absolutely just right. Glad to be here with you guys. Hell yeah, brother. All right, my man. You ready to take this picture? Yeah, let's do, do it. some rips. Let's do it. Hell yeah, man. Hell so, yeah. so we got we got the boys here. They're gonna follow. They're gonna take some sick rollers with the car, and we're gonna get some really sweet sounds for you guys. Cannot wait. Me too. Man. All right, so give us a startup process here. All right. So first step is you turn on the battery power right here, which activates a big relay in the back. And we've got our tack, our shift light transmission temperature, this oil pressure gauge, don't worry about it, it doesn't work right now, these are just dummies. Race pack tells us all of our stuff. All right, so the first thing that we're gonna do, because we're a mechanical fuel pump, we can't start the car without starter fluid unless we have fuel pressure. So right here, we have our lift pump, which turns on our in-tank fuel pump, just, just to supply the rails. So you hit that, okay? And then back here, I'll turn on the AccuSump, which bleeds oil pressure into the engine, I've already done that. And then you just hit the starter and you're ready to go. So why? 
squats, you want some pneumatics, but I'll do it for a squat. is without a doubt one of the most wild street cars. And I'll say street cars because we just cruised around. Oh, I forgot to wear this. For about <laughs> too yeah. much excitement. We forgot to put on the, the GoPro head strap. But this is honestly without a doubt one of the most wild street cars. Man, Thanks, I can't man. thank you enough, man. This is thank you, it's, man. A, it's a dream to be able to to film this car, man. We've our whole team is honestly like just completely geeking out over this thing. We've been, I know we've been trying to make it over to Alabama to, to come to feature this thing. And when I found out you came to TX2K, I couldn't be more excited, man. Dude, it's nice to meet you, Javier. I appreciate yeah. it, man, it was great. There's a massive crowd over here. I guess you can say this thing, uh, the milkshake brings all the boys to the yard. Because everyone, everyone is around. Everyone's around this thing. I mean, it's just like, it's like this is the biggest crowd here.
That's a well-deserved round of applause, yeah? I mean, I mean, it doesn't get better than that. It really doesn't. It really doesn't. Turbo four-rotor making 1,200 horsepower, two-stepping in front of our faces. I can't hear. Like, I can't. It's okay. I mean, I'm, I can't I'm hear shit. 100% worth the hearing loss. What's up guys, my name is David Mize, Mize Formula. I've got a YouTube channel. Uh, thanks for watching, I'm here with TRC. We're at Texas 2K 2021. This is my first time here, it's a super awesome event. I came down with my buddy Tim Nevins, been helping me out a lot on the race car. And it's super awesome to be out here and meet everybody, especially the guys from TRC. To be out here and see it in person, this event, it's super awesome, man. So uh, this is my 1993 Mazda RX-7 started out as an R1 model. It was just a parts car, basically just a roller. It had really no interior or suspension or anything. It was kind of beat up. I uh, sold my three rotor car to build this one. And it was my dream to r always do a uh, four rotor because they have the sound of like a Formula One car from the 90s or the early 2000s. <laughs> We went and put a uh, roll cage inside the car, uh, had that done by Kirk Racing in Birmingham. And the next step was to start doing the paint and body work. Uh, I wanted it to sort of look like a factory Mazda RX-7 uh, that was modified, like kind of like if you were looking at a GT3 car, I wanted it to look something like that, right? Like a GT3 version of a Mazda RX-7. Went with the 99 spec front bumper, which you see here that has the uh, license plate molding in the front. And I've always wanted to see an oil cooler there. So I was like, let's, let's get that 99 spec bumper, let's cut it out, let's put an oil cooler up front. I think it would look pretty cool to have the lines coming into the bottom of it with a little uh, mechanical gauge on the front of that thing. So uh, that was the first thing that I ordered for the car, actually, right when I just had the bare chassis. And the next thing was, let's figure out the fenders and the rest of the wide body. So I kind of pieced together some stuff. I used the wide body front fenders from the feed kit, which is relatively popular. That came from Shine Auto in California. It's a replica of the feed fenders. Uh, and then we went with 99 spec tail lights. I really like the look of those. And we went with like a duckbill spoiler on the back of the car. Uh, and then we needed to have some air road, some downforce, because I knew this thing was going to make a lot of power. And the goal was to make it a road race car, you know, something that could do time attack. And so we went with the chassis mount spoiler. Uh, from Battle Arrow, which we modified a little bit. Uh, and then we did a tubular front end from the shock towers forward. I want to thank my friend JD uh, from Crowworks at the time for doing that, because getting in here and trying to fit a four rotor engine, all the cooling components, uh, takes up a lot of space, right? Once we had the chassis stuff dialed in and we, you know, thought about all that, then we started doing the paint and body work. Painted the car myself, got an Amazon car tent, dropped some uh, a tarp over the sides of it, a little box fan, and just went to work, man. So. Everything you see has pretty much been done in the storage unit or with my friends. The engine, the power plant, everybody wants to know about is a four rotor. And that engine came in the Mazda 787B, which was a race car from Mazda that won the 1991 24 hours Le Mans. You know, Mazda offered the 13B and the 20B, which was the two rotor and the three rotor engine. And those are basically like a four cylinder and a six cylinder counterpart uh, in the rotary world. But the four rotor was something that was really unique. It was only uh, made by Mazda for racing. So it wasn't offered uh, for street use or for, you know, you couldn't buy that engine for private use. And so people have been making them, putting them in street cars by making them themselves. And so we started with a shop from New Zealand and got the crankshaft and the engine from there. You know, it was a lot of research and development, a lot of trial and error. So the first version of the engine didn't really work out right. Uh, and after we did some testing and tuning on that, had some issues. Uh, we decided to tear it down and really get in detail with it. And I, so I took the engine and the crankshaft to uh, Chip Ursu, Zachariah and Clint Richardson up north, uh, Indiana and Detroit. And they looked at the engine and we figured out how to get the peripheral ports to not leak. We did O-ringed inserts. Uh, we fixed the crank angles to get them perfect on the crankshaft, remachined the keyways, a whole bunch of cool stuff to get the engine set up right. Went with the goopy apex seals, 
uh, really took a fine look at all the engineering. You know, basically went through the motor and set it up to where we'd be 100% sure this thing would run right and reliable on the street. And the biggest thing about this motor that makes it different from uh, all the other, you know, 13Bs and 20Bs is this four rotor is a full peripheral port. Now, sometimes you'll see that in a 13B and a 20B, but it's pretty rare. It's usually on an NA car and a peripheral port is uh, similar to having a really long duration high overlap camshaft that you'd see on a naturally aspirated motor. So basically your intake and your exhaust timing, they're open at the same time for that high RPM. And so putting a turbocharger on a peripheral port, a little bit of a challenge because you have to make sure that your exhaust manifold back pressure and your intake pressure is pretty much a one-to-one -one ratio. So we had to go with a really big turbocharger which would have a hot side that was large enough to flow the exhaust energy that we needed without backing up and creating an, an exhaust back pressure that was higher than the intake pressure. Meaning if you had 20 pounds of boost in the intake, you wanna make sure that you have less than 20 pounds of boost in the exhaust. That's the only way to efficiently run a peripheral port with a turbocharger because because your ports are open at the same time, you don't want to revert that exhaust energy back through the intake and lose volumetric efficiency. So we went to this really large Garrett GTX 5533R, at the time it was one of the largest turbochargers offered. Um, looking at the Garrett G57 now, which has an even larger hot side if we want to go with more power, but this thing has been working great for us. as a 1.4 area ratio, 98 millimeter compressor wheel, 118 millimeter exhaust wheel made from Incanel that will support the really high exhaust temperatures that are generated by the rotary engine. And then so after we pick out the turbocharger, then we have to make an exhaust manifold that complements that. The exhaust manifold design was really tricky. We've actually been through three exhaust manifolds on this car. Actually, everything that you see in the, on this car has about two or three iterations. So we've done two fuel systems, two exhaust systems, three manifolds, two different turbos. And so we had to make a manifold that would work with this turbocharger and this setup uh, to give us the performance that we want, the sound that we want, the, uh, the horsepower that we're looking for, and would be able to handle the heat. You know, after doing two exhaust manifold designs, um, I went and spoke with this guy, Carlos Lopez, super awesome man. Um, he's actually has cancer right now, so, you know, prayers go out to him. He's a real inspiration uh, hero to me. Uh, he's been doing a lot of work with the Mazda Le Mans program. He's built uh, tons of rotary engines, worked on the four rotor project, and he told me uh, uh, what he recommended as far as runner length and diameter and uh, merge angle and collector design. And so we took that and I went to uh, this guy, good friend of mine, Walker Morgan from Morgan Performance Fabrication in Birmingham, a phenomenal welder. Basically, I went to him with all this crazy stuff and I was like, dude, you gotta do this, 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 and this and make this manifold look like this. And he's like, holy shit, dude, that's crazy. I bet you it's not gonna make a difference because it's a turbo car. Turbos, you know, everyone thought at the time a turbo is not gonna affect, like, you're not gonna get the same sound with a turbo. It's gonna ruin the sound, right? But we stuck to our guns and we said, look, if make it this design, do this, maybe it'll sound like the 7A7B. And the sound has been everything, right? So we wanna make sure that works. So after about 100 hours of manifold design, we used 321 stainless, schedule 10, put this thing together, slapped the turbo on it, you know, did all the, uh, fuel system and uh, ignition, everything, and fired it up. We had that sound, man, that, that it sounded like a V8 Formula One from the, from the 90s, or just like the 787B. After knocking out the turbocharger and all that, we had to figure out how we could give this thing enough fuel, right? Uh, so we want to run it on E85 to keep it cool uh, so we can run a lot of boost and not have to worry about knock. Rotaries don't like heat, they don't like knock. They rely on fuel to cool them down. If you keep a rotary cool and you give it enough fuel supply, uh, run a fat air fuel ratio and you're conservative on your timing, uh, these things will last forever because they don't have a valve train and you know the, the, the rotor spins at a third the rate of the crankshaft so it's a really cool engine that's how they won the 24-hour Le Mans but you got to have fuel right and if you're adding boost now you have to have a 
buttload of fuel. So uh, it turns out that the amount of fuel this car requires, we couldn't use electronic pumps. I tried three different Bosch 044s, had problems with cavitation, surge tanks, all kinds of stuff. So I said, you know what, we're gonna go to a mechanical fuel injection. We're gonna treat this just like a drag car, but we're gonna set it up for the street. And so what we did was ended up going with a uh, external mechanical fuel pump from Weldon and I mounted that fuel pump on a, uh, a, a sump that was welded to the bottom of the tank and then I drive that fuel pump with a mechanical cable drive. The cable drive runs all the way through the chassis underneath the car, sort of like a speedo cable inside a sheath, and that connects to the back of the oil pump. I run an external oil pump, and that oil pump has been machined with a hex flange on the back side of it, which will drive that cable, which then spins the fuel pump. So basically when the car is running, as long as it has oil pressure and the oil pump is being driven by the belt from the crankshaft, you have fuel pressure and, and fuel flow along with that. And the more RPMs that you rev the motor, the more fuel pressure you have. And so what that allows us to do is drive the injectors at a really high fuel pressure and not have to worry about flow rates dropping off like what would happen on traditional electronic pumps. And we also don't need a significant amount of amperage from the alternator. And so I can't tell you exactly what our setup is altogether, but I can tell you we run a lot of base pressure fuel, which gives us an incredible atomization. So on a peripheral port engine, again, when you only have four runners instead of eight, uh, and the runners are so large, you have low intake port velocity because it's such a large intake runner. And with that low intake velocity, uh, you're sitting there in vacuum and when you crack the throttle plate open, that fuel falls out of suspension and you have uh, a moment where you have to make up for that drop of fuel uh, in, in, your transient, in your transient fueling. And so by having a lot of fuel pressure, we can hit it with incredible transient fuel response settings in the ECU and, and be able to drive the car really crisp and clean without having to have ITBs or get very complicated with the setup. So I think that's one of the greatest things that we have on the car, that mechanical fuel pump. Um, it's been very reliable. And so the way we start the car, you'll see most guys drag cars, they'll use uh, starter fluid. They'll spray it into the compressor wheel, the, comp uh, the turbocharger, or open the throttle and spray it in to get the car to fire up because obviously you're not building fuel pressure until the car is running because you have to have the crankshaft turning to make the pressure, right? Well, I wanted this thing to be able to start and drive and pull it out of your driveway and go to McDonald's if you want to. So what we did was we used the stock in-tank fuel pump, which is just you know 200 liters per hour or whatever, and I tee it in line to the fuel pressure regulator and I set it up on a momentary switch so the stock fuel pump starts the car. And then as soon as the car is running, there's a backflow valve that prevents the uh, main fuel system from feeding back into the tank. and you know, once the engine's running, the mechanical field's taken over and then that feeds the engine from there on. And it's been very reliable and awesome. You know, we run the injector dynamic injectors on this engine, two stages. So we have a primary stage that runs around on, you know, lower RPM, lower throttle positions. And then we have the secondary stage that opens up when you hit boost and you're making more power. Um, then looking at the ECU, uh, we went with the Haltech Elite 2500. I think it's been a very reliable platform. I enjoy tuning on that computer. I uh, I like the VE tuning of that software. Uh, it's been very repeatable on different cars. I like the way that the transient throttle settings work. I've been able to do some fancy things. Transient throttle and getting a peripheral port tuned is very difficult. And this ECU has allowed me to be able to do it with the options that I have with the transient, transient fueling. And also the flex fuel capabilities of using the E85 and being able to run gasoline as well. Uh, so we're using the Haltech 2500, we have the AEM smart coils, otherwise known as the IGN-1As and direct fire, uh, that's our ignition system. And of course the rotary has leading and trailing sparks so we can you know, play with the split timing in the ECU with that. Uh, and I use the factory crank trigger, I don't see any problems with it until you're running lots of boost and you have to worry about trigger walk. But we don't really have any issue with that. This engine makes so much power with so little boost, which is one of the keys to, to wanting to do a four rotor. You know, again, like rotaries do not like knock, and knock comes from high cylinder pressure, lots of timing, lean air fuel ratios. As you go up in boost, you generate more intake charge temperature from the compression of the air, and uh, that can cause your fuel to reach its flash point and you can detonate, right? So if you can keep the cylinder pressure down, you can keep your charge temperatures down, and you don't have to put a lot of pressure in the motor. You can flow that CFM by having a big motor with a big turbocharger. You can derive that horsepower with only 12 or 14 pounds of boost instead of running you know, 30 or 35. And by doing so, we can make 1,100, 1,200 horsepower, you know, 18, 24 pounds of boost, and this engine will live. You know, we, we've taken it to Road Atlanta, we've taken it to Barber, we've ran it on the street, high boost, doing fifth gear, sixth gear pulls. <laughs> Thank you.
happy with the way this motor runs and with the ECU especially. Um, and so, you know, moving on to the drivetrain, originally started out with a stock transmission. You know, you have to start out and you have to get everything else that's important running first. You know, we use the stock transmission. I remember people saying, oh, you're going to break it. Why would you do that? It's underpowered. I mean, the car's overpowered for the trans. You know, I had a stock differential and all that at the time too. But it was all about development, all about figuring out, you know, priority first. You know, what's the most important part of the puzzle? Getting the engine working, right? Once you figure out the tuning, get the engine working, then you invest in the other pieces of the puzzle, right? So after we had the stock transmission, we put a gear set in it, which was quite expensive. We thought it was gonna work out, but you know, we get out to Auto Club Speedway, first lap out. My buddy Brian's driving the car. He's following the 787B, which was a dream come true, super cool. Gearbox broke, it just couldn't handle it. It wasn't the gears themselves, it was the case. I mean, the torque of the four rotor just cracked that thing in half. So I was like, it, man, okay, look, we're not gonna do a T56. We're not gonna you know, put a standard box in the car and risk anything happening again. Let's go all the way. Let's match this engine with something that is you know, gonna be harmonious with it. You know, Something that will work with this motor. Looking at the power band of the peripheral port engine, it screams from about 7,000 to 9,500 RPMs. What we need to do is we need to pair that engine with a transmission that has a close ratios between the gears. Right? So we want an engine, a transmission that every time you shift, you're still within that power band. And we also want to be able to shift very quickly and keep the throttle down. Because if we can keep the throttle open, the turbo will always stay on boost between shifts and we'll never lose the turbocharger. And the car will just feel almost like an electric car. So I went with the Quaif QBE 69G sequential transmission. It's a six speed close ratio. My buddy Brian Leonard, this pro IMSA driver friend of mine in Birmingham, I uh, got to thank him a lot for the help. He hooked me up with a uh, Geartronics paddle shift system that uses pneumatics. It came from a Porsche car, Porsche race car. So I pulled that thing off, wired it up, plumbed it. Buddy Tim helped me, a bunch of my friends helped me. I remember us testing it, making sure the paddles work and... Basically, I rigged it up because I wanted to have the mechanical actuation of being able to pull the lever and shift the transmission, you know, just in case we're in a bind, we don't have air pressure, we're trying to get it on and off the trailer. So if you want, you can shift the car with your hand, um, but also if you want to go crazy, you can pull the paddle. And when you pull the paddle, what happens is the uh, air compressor behind the driver's seat uh, fires up and it charges up a tank behind the passenger seat, which then sends pressurized air uh, through a solenoid system, which is tied into this gear control unit, which uh, actuates the ECU to do a spark cut. And so when you pull the paddle, it cuts the spark momentarily while pneumatically firing the shifter into the next gear. And so what this allows us to do is make 35, 40 millisecond shift times and be able to do, be wide open throttle. And that's that bang that you hear on the racetrack. <laughs> that backfire loud bang you hear is basically uh, the spark being cut and coming back on. You're hearing the fuel dump into the hot exhaust and you hear that backfire, that loud pop, and the gear is just changing uh, rapidly, very quickly with the throttle open. So if we look at the manifold air pressure trace on a racetrack, you'll see that when the driver's wide open throttle coming out of corner exit, going through the gears on the back straight, the manifold pressure is just continually rising the whole time. And if anything, it, it, it bumps up between shifts. So every time you grab that paddle, it just gets faster and faster and faster. And very happy with the Quaif transmission. I'm using a spec triple plate clutch. Uh, I want to thank SPEC. They've helped out a lot. Uh, I've been to SEMA with them uh, last year. Uh, the SPEC clutch triple plate has done really well in this car um, that allows us to drive the car without gripping too hard but also can handle the power and the heat of being slipped is, uh, is very crucial in making a peripheral port drivable. So, you know, thanks to all those guys that helped out. Some other things about the car, uh, you know, a lot of people ask, what's this huge ass scoop on the back? Um, yeah, I mean, it's kind of not the most amazing looking thing it is I think it looks kind of cartoonish but cool at the same time uh, but people always ask what's the big shark fin for okay so that comes off an NSX JD GTC race car which is a race car back from the 90s that used to race in uh, 
you know, circuit racing in Japan and stuff. And I thought it was a killer looking scoop. It kind of looks like the Formula One scoops. And the reason for that is we have to cool down the intake for the motor. But what we have going on here is an integrated water to air intake manifold. So one of the problems with uh, putting the four order in the car is figuring out where you want to put this engine, right? So we could have cut the firewall and moved the engine back and done all that. Don't you think I tried that? But at the time, I really just wanted to keep it like sort of like a street car. I didn't want to move the engine back. At the time, I didn't think I was going to really competitively put this thing on the racetrack. So I really wanted to keep the engine in the stock location. So it actually bolts up exactly where the stock motor mounts mount for the, for the 13B. Of course, the only difference is the motor hangs out over the front strut towers. Roll center and center of gravity is thrown off a little bit, especially with the huge turbocharger. But, you know, I think it looks cool and it drives fine. We do have a little bit of mid-corner understeer, uh, but we work our way around it with corner balancing. And, you know, Fortune Auto, by the way, we use the Fortune Auto 510 series coilovers. The guys are super sick. They hooked me up with these things. Met them at SEMA too. Really awesome people, really awesome customer service. If you ever need anything, you call them up, they're always there available for you. So we use their coilovers on the car. That allowed us to set the chassis up. Putting the engine in the car, you know, we knew that it was gonna extend past the, uh, the front shock towers. And so we have a limited room. So there's not a place to put a front mount intercooler. Uh, I suppose you could lengthen the chassis and the nose and put the intercooler up front. My biggest regret, well, but I really wanted to keep the same wheelbase and the same design and, and have it look like a you know factory front end as far as the bumper. I needed to use all that space for a radiator because you have to have about 50% more volume uh, and surface area to get the, the airflow and, or the cooling that you need for this motor. So we cannot put a front mount intercooler and then we also can't do a V mount intercooler. So how are we going to cool down the charge temperatures? So we're left with water to air intercooling, which also we can't put a water to air intercooler in the, in the engine bay. So let's just make it into the intake manifold. That's what we're left with. So what we ended up doing is using two Garrett intercooler cores and welding them together and putting them inside the engine bay and making them as part of the intake manifold. So they're actually post throttle and they feed the peripheral port runners. And so as the air comes through the throttle body, it's being cooled down by those charge coolers inside the intake manifold. And so there's very little pressure drop because a water to air intercooler core doesn't have any piping that it has to flow through. That's one of the great things about water to air intercooling. And it actually helps comb the airflow and slow down and, and prevent turbulence as it runs through the core. And so now what we have to do is cool that core down with water. So what we do is we run A in lines through the core and out the backside. And those A in lines run to a water tank in the trunk, which has a Lincoln Felter modified water pump. That water pump flows all of this water in a cycle and it runs through this big tank, which gives us capacitance and volume to absorb the heat from the intake charge. And then that runs through the uh, cooler, which is mounted uh, horizontally on the rear hatch, which you can see the vent over top of the spoiler back here. Not the most efficient design for airflow. There's probably better ways to do it. We're looking at ways to be able to evacuate the air off the car, but being that we're on E85 and you know we have pretty decent sized coolers. The scoop is feeding this uh, rear cooler back here to help force air under and out of it and evacuate it at high speeds. We're seeing pretty decent intake charge temperatures, all things considered. Uh, and we're able to make 900 to 1100 horsepower pretty reliably and stay on the throttle for, you know, five, six laps at the track. <laughs> Obviously this isn't an endurance race car and it's really not built for any competitive purpose. For me it's mainly just a prototype. It's to learn and develop and understand how and what this engine needs, how the tuning works, how it behaves, make the sounds we want to make. All of this kind of works together as an orchestra. You have just a little bit here and a little bit there and you put it together and it all works. Moving on to the next system, we have to talk about the oil system. So we have three oil coolers on the front of the car, uh, one 15 row, two 30 row oil coolers you run. Uh, 10 AN and 12 AN lines through that system. We use a Peterson R4 oil pump that's belt driven externally off the crankshaft, uh, which has adjustable bypass regulator. That allows us to have maintain the oil pressure we need to the bearings on the engine at high RPM. I've got a custom front splitter 
Uh, it's made out of wood. You know, a lot of people laughed at it at SEMA. They go, why does this dude have a wood splitter? Well, if you want to take a carbon fiber splitter and scrape it on a speed bump and pay $6,000, be my guest. But uh, the wood works great, man. I've already replaced it three times. All you got to do is cut it out and uh, spray paint it and throw it up there. It's got a little uh, boxed in frame under it, made it from Home Depot, works great, taking it to 170 miles an hour. And that's one of my favorite pieces of the car, man. Just, you know, doing what you gotta do to make things work, that's all part of it. Uh, it was really important to me to have wheels that kind of look period specific to the car. The wheels that we have on her Workmeister three-piece wheels, you know, we did custom barrels to get the offsets exactly where we wanted it. We're using the Toyo Racing Slicks. I want to thank Toyo a lot for sending these things. These things hook so hard that I keep them on the car on the street. I've used other R compound tires, but man, I'll tell you what, just it's probably not ideal, it's probably not recommended, but running the full racing slicks on the street, it's the only thing I can get to hook up on the car. And they do have a stiff sidewall. These are not drag radials, but you know they do function well on the racetrack and off the racetrack. So when you see me ripping around in the videos, that's what we're using. You know, we started out with the stock brakes, which was not ideal. We went to Road Atlanta, we were at like 150 miles an hour coming down the back straight. It just could not handle the heat and we we're starting to boil the fluid. So moved to the Brembo uh, four piston front and rear. We sized the piston size on the calipers to work well with the front rear weight distribution of the car and uh, moved away from the brake booster and went to, to this custom unit under the hood that we call a uh, brake bias unit, right? So basically we have two master cylinders, one for the front of the car, one for the rear, and we have a bias bar that runs between both master cylinders, which the pedal is connected to. And so what that allows us to do is we can go inside the car and we can adjust the brake bias using the tilting uh, knob in the car, which mechanically uh, changes the angle at which the pedal applies to one master cylinder versus the other. And so by doing this, we have uh, safeguards in case we lose, uh, let's say we boil the brake pressure and the pedal gets spongy and it's hard to stop the car. Well, you're, you're more likely, if, if you have two separate systems, let's say you boil the front system, well, you still have the rear. Also, what this allows us to do is dial in the bias uh, incrementally and with perfection so that we don't lock the front wheels before the rears or vice versa. And also by using a manual braking system and getting the pedal ratio right, which again, I wanna thank Brian Leonard and Chase McMaster for helping me set that up. Getting the pedal ratio right and having a manual braking system is ideal, I think for both a, both a street car and a track car, uh, mainly because of the resolution that you have behind your foot. When you have a brake booster and you have a car that doesn't generate a lot of vacuum, things are kind of changing all the time. If you're left foot braking while you're you know coming out of the coming out of the turn and you're on and off boost and stuff like that, you know, the, the, the pedal effort is changing in response to how much um, results you're getting. But when you have a manual braking system, that pedal's always firm, it's always there, you know exactly how much you're applying so that you can be right on the edge and you can really push on that thing and not have to worry about locking up the brakes. All these systems work together to make this thing uh, happen. Every square inch of this car, we have it packed with all kinds of electronics and things. It's the only thing, there's just so limited real estate on the car for putting coolers. We've got three oil coolers, we've got you know, a radiator, we've got water to air intercoolers, we've got uh, transmission cooler. If you look on the back bumper, we have a transmission cooler for the gearbox. We have a fuel cooler that cools the return flow. There's a whole lot tied into the project, um, but I'm super excited. I've been working on this thing for about three to four years. Uh, tons of friends and family to thank, man. If, I mean, there's just, there's so many people that have participated, rotary guys all across the world. When you build a car, I mean, I think it's all about, you know, uh, first you have to like go out there and see what exists and what makes you excited. And so, you know, you, you gotta take inspirations um, from the industry, the people that are out there doing it. And one of my favorite cars, one of my first inspirations uh, behind the four rotor and the three rotor projects, back when I had a 13B way back in the day, um, was Logan Carswell with Define Auto Works. He's one of my favorites, man. I remember him doing a three rotor RX-7 wide body ITB crazy monster NA race car. And then he built this really sick NA four rotor um, that is just absolutely incredible. The TRC guys covered it. Make sure you watch the video. I rode in the car. He brought it down to Birmingham. absolutely phenomenal. 
Uh, and the car corners so hard. It's got 335 millimeter tires all the way around, uh, 10 inches extra track, track width on the car. He did the wide body himself, like when he was injured from wrecking his own car, he's like hanging from a hoist above his car, like designing stuff. I mean, the dude's absolutely incredible. ITB slide throttles. I mean, it's just the most amazing car I've ever seen. And so that was one of my major inspirations, man. Just watching that guy do all that stuff himself, following his build threads. Um, you know, another guy, Abel Ibarra, uh, has helped me out a lot. You know, he's one of the NHRA drag racing heroes uh, of the rotary world, you know, setting world records you know, back in the early 2000s, late 90s, you know, three rotors making 1600 horsepower, you know, so that's where I got the turbo inspiration, you know, wanting to go really fast and make a lot of boost. Uh, and he's helped me out a lot with, you know, feedback on, you know, how to set things up. And I met him, you know, out in California. And while I was there, I also met uh, my hero from Japan, which is uh, the Ar Aria Mimia. He actually signed the dash and, uh, you know, got to shake his hand. Uh, he's an original JGTC race, racer and makes tons of parts for the RX-7, wide body kits, all kinds of cool stuff. He's, you know, he's an OG man. Uh, and there's, there's just so many people, so many RX-7 guys out there um, that have done so many incredible things for many years that keep the rotary alive. It's just great. It's, it's just so great to know all these people, get to meet them through this car, you know, from, you know, just seeing them on the internet and following them, never met them, never talked to them. and then. You know, after three or four years of building the project and going different places, and you're like, holy crap, I'm riding in this car that I saw on the internet for years. Uh, and, and that's the best part about it, man. It's just, it's meeting the people that you just always dreamed about doing what they did and having them be like, dude, you know, let's talk about how you did this and let me talk about, like, let me ask you how you did this and go to dinner together and then ride in each other's cars. I mean, just, I can't think of anything better. You've seen this car ripping and stuff, but let me tell you what, there's another awesome car, four rotor out here too. He's right behind me, stay tuned. You guys gotta see this thing. Uh, we're working out some bugs on it right now. Again, you know how much of a process it is. You've heard about it. This guy's built this car in like a year, so he's still got some work to do on it. But I'll tell you what, it's coming along. It runs, it drives. We made 800 horsepower on it in Texas uh, a few weeks ago, and we're turning up the boost some more. It's a full billet engine four rotor peripheral port again, twin turbo, uh, and it's all wheel drive, right? And it's got a Lamborghini Graziano transaxle with a torque tube, custom torque tube. I mean, this thing is incredible. So uh, the guy did all the body work himself, did all the fabrication work himself. His name is Todd, super cool guy. Just met him a few weeks ago and uh, hoping to help him tune the car together and uh, check it out, man, because it's gonna be sick when this thing is ripping. You know, it's just been a, it's been a labor of love, man. Just every step of the way, just trying to solve problems, stay positive, stay focused and focus on the goal, which was this car is for the experience, for the driver and the, the, the passenger experience or for the people that are listening. Uh, because it just, why do we, to me, it's like, why do we go racing? Why do we like race cars? And to me, it's about the overall experience, the excitement, like, and, and that experience ties into all of your senses. It's not just, you know, being pushed back into the seat. It's also the sound. It's also the emotion. It's also the fear, right? So we don't need windows, right? And we don't want power steering and air conditioning and electric, you know, brakes and all these creature comforts. We want this thing to be raw. And, you know, when I get in this car, I want to hear it, I want to smell it, I want to feel it. I want it to scare the shit out of me. And whoever drives it, I want them to understand that, you know, uh, it's gonna drive you, you know? And so when you give it throttle, it's gonna go and you're gonna have snap over steer, you're gonna have to wrestle it. It has manual steering. You cannot take a turn uh, at the racetrack without both hands on the steering wheel. And that's what it's all about, man. Hearing that gearbox change gears, hearing those bangs, hearing that transmission scream, hearing the wastegates open up and, you know, throw 110 decibels of sound out of the hood with fireballs. That's what it's all about, man. The overall experience, the adrenaline that you feel from it. And there's not a time that, it, there's never a time that I start this car, even when I'm diagnosing it, even when something's screwed up, when I hear this engine run, it just, uh, it just makes me smile, man. And I'm just so thankful for the people that have done it before me and the machinists that are out there, the people that have advanced the industry and, and all the technology that exists today to be able to do this. And we can't wait to do more, man. So I want to thank TRC for covering my car. Super awesome opportunity to be able to put this thing out here on the internet. Uh, thank all you guys for watching the Mize Formula channel. Please subscribe to TRC. Please subscribe to my channel too. Uh, I'm going to be trying to put up more videos, uh, doing things with my friends. You know, we're going to be going to the racetrack. We're going to be doing all kinds of cool stuff. I got friends that are into drifting, uh, friends that are into racing, you know, road racing. So check us out, man. 
And uh, thanks a lot for watching my video, man. Appreciate it.